espais d'understanys. Bé, comencem, si us sembla, aquest seminari. En primer lloc, moltes gràcies per ser avui aquí. Aquest seminari sobre la conveniència o no de constitucionalitzar la cessació. Intentarem respondre a la pregunta de si és desitjable introduir a les constitucions dels estats demolliberals la clàusula de cessació, la possibilitat de cessació. En definitiva, la gran pregunta és com acomodem jurídicament les qüestions, les demandes de cessació en els estats específicament de democràcia lliberal. El seminari tindrem molt en compte les experiències del referèndum d'independència d'Escòcia del 2014 i per suposat també el cas català, però farem l'anàlisi des d'un punt de vista més general. En definitiva, les bases jurídiques i filosòfiques del fenomen de la cessació relacionat sempre amb la seva constitucionalització. Aquesta és, evidentment, una qüestió que tots vostès saben que és d'una gran actualitat política a casa nostra, però també té un vessant acadèmic o teòric molt important, no solament aquí, sinó arreu del món, i això és el que analitzarem. De fet, s'han publicat ja moltes obres recentment, i no tan recentment, sobre aquestes qüestions, tant en l'àmbit del dret com en l'àmbit de la ciència política. I per parlar d'aquesta qüestió hem convidat el professor David Gaffen, més o menys... Hagen? Hagen. Hagen. És difícil per mi. Perquè és professor de la Universitat Catòlica de la Baina. Ha treballat sobre aquest tema, constitucionalisme i normativitat. Es va doctorar amb una tesi precisament sobre judicialització de la cessació. Va ser professor convidat, investigador postdoctoral a la Universitat d'Utrecht i després va fer d'advocat als estats d'Ontario i Alberta, al Canadà. Recentment ha publicat un llibre, que és una mica el que ens convoca aquí, titulat precisament això, la constitucionalització de la cessació. I per comentar la intervenció del nostre convidat, no repetiré el nom, tenim el jurista i professor associat de la Universitat Pompeu Fabra, Josep Costa, és prou conegut per tots per tots nosaltres, va publicar un important article el 2003 sobre les teories de la cessació, minories, majories i estats multinacionals i recentment l'editorial, recentment, és de l'any d'aquest mateix any, l'editorial Contravent ha publicat el seu primer llibre, segur que no serà l'últim, que es titula Cessació o Cessació. Comencem, per tant, si us sembla, amb el professor... The floor is yours. So, uh, thank you uh, for your comments. Um, let me start by saying my heartfelt thanks to uh, Mark uh, and to the Institute uh, for their invitation to speak to you here today. And they're organizing my attendance and stay here. Uh, it is my first time in Barcelona my first time in Catalonia, and my first time in Spain. And I think that's the right order of matter of things, isn't it? Um, thank you for, for coming here today, and I look forward to hearing your comments and your arguments at the end of our discussion. Needless to say, and with October 1st in, um, before us, I am somewhat apprehensive in coming to speak to you here today. What I want to talk to you about is the idea of constitutionalizing secession. It is an idea that comes from a judgment of the 1988, um, in 1988 from the Supreme Court of Canada in the Quebec secession reference. And the Spanish Constitutional Court has cited that decision with approval in its decision of 
2014, the 25th of March, that is STC 42214. You may well want to ask why anyone would want to constitutionalize secession other than as an academic exercise in hypotheticals or an essay in abstract political philosophy. Well, I intend to outline for you today four propositions which I believe suggest a more direct, tangible reason, namely the preservation of legitimacy and calm for all, all parties in a democracy under stress. And the claims are as follows. And you can see them on the screen before you. Secession can be made subject to constitutional control, providing we discard a limited vision of a constitution as a rigid text and framework of explicit rules. And in its place, we need a more accurate and more democratic conception of a constitution as the active engagement of citizens and institutions together in partnership, in association. Now, to constitutionalize secession means controlling and managing secessionist forces through prescribed constitutional channels. I wouldn't be a constitutional lawyer if I didn't advocate that first out. This entails seeking cooperation and common ground within a complex intertwined range of interests of finding unity and consent amid difference, disagreement, and veto. But what it means is, ultimately, that a constitutionalized secession can no longer be unilateral, univocal, one-sided. If a constitutionalized secession, you'll see in point three, is multilateral and multivocal, then a hardline response, a no independence at all, positioned by a central government to a pro-independence referendum is not anti-democratic, unconstitutional, impermissible. A region must be prepared to accept the defeasibility of its proposal if we accept the model of constitutionalized secession. Constitutionalizing secession, therefore, is my final point before you today, is that it brings the entire population of a state into the conversation about a constitution, it brings the entire demos together without privileging one particular group over another by conferring on that group a determinative voice or veto. Um, I'm under no illusion that this position can make me very few, if any, political friends here. And I freely concede uh, that this approach can, or may be seen effectively to frustrate a secessionist move, except in the most dire of circumstances. You've had Professor Alan Buchanan speak to you before in this series. Uh, he advocates remedial secession. I'm part of his group um, in which remedial secession is seen as only in the most dire of circumstances when a democracy has fallen apart can a group secede. But you shouldn't understand my position to be one in which we dissolve or disempower regional local concerns in favor of some stylized, distant public good of the state. It's diametrically opposed to that. For me, the core function, the heart of a democratic constitution and constitutionalism is the continual engagement of citizens and institutions in a common project, a common project based on reciprocity, mutuality, and solidarity. So let's get into it. My first proposition, namely that we should constitutionalize secession. Well, I think that constitutional secession is seen or is understood by most as a misnomer, an oxymoron, a contradiction in terms. It is either a constitutionalized process of orderly state dissolution, or it's a true secession, chaos, revolution, everything that Hobbes described in his Leviathan, where life is nasty, brutish, and short. But for convenience here today, let's just stick with the notion of constitutionalized secession, or more precisely, constitutionalizing secession. I want to have the idea of motion or activity in it. Constitutionalizing secession is not simply a question of drafting constitutional provisions for 
a constitutional text to recognize, accept the possibility of secession. We have constitutions that do that. They do mention it, they accept it, but they do not, at least to this point, set out in any detail the terms of how a secession should proceed, the nature of the question, the nature of the majorities, and so on. You have scholars who write a good deal on that and have offered a number of suggestions on that point, including some fellow Canadians, Daniel Weinstock included. Well, the reasons can be categorized. There are two sorts of reasons for this. The first one I'm just going to state and I'm not going to discuss. And the, f the first one is quite simply, it's a hard question. It's hard emotionally, it's hard politically. And it's only in rare, strange, I would say, circumstances that we give thought to how our relationships ought to be dissolved. And when we do do that, what we're doing is we're saying divorce is a real possibility when we enter that relationship. We go into it thinking, ah, yes, at some point, we're going to split apart. And that's not what really happens in state making. At moments of constitution making, all of our energy and attention are directed at state building, nation making, bringing the people together. Now, the second reason, and the more important one here for our discussions today, is that we all assume that secession is an exclusively a political question by which I mean it raises political matters beyond the scope of law, what lawyers do. It's not for lawyers like, like me or my colleagues to decide. It's for you to decide. It's for the people to decide. Because that is your basic right as citizens in a democracy. It is the pouvoir constituant. It is the power to constitute a society and the institutions that make up that society. So secession does concern, yes, constitutional politics, but Constitutional law, no, not at all. But I contend that calling something a political issue to exclude constitutional law is simply assuming that, a simple, we're assuming a different sort of, or a different understanding of constitutional law. It's a very specific sort of constitutional law. We're relying on certain concepts of law and politics and constitution which have all been predefined and unexamined. Specifically, the function of a constitution is to stipulate, to set down the divisions of social power into various institutions, organs, bodies, each with various powers, also set out clearly in a document. Things that the Spanish constitution, the Canadian constitution, the Belgian constitution do. The form of a constitution then is something like a, a recipe with specific ingredients that have to be added in a specific way to get a specific result. And for those of you that are students of Niklas Luhmann, you see here elements of his notion of systems theory. Independent systems, constitutional law is an independent system, politics an independent system, and they don't communicate. Well, I don't agree with that. I don't think constitutions are simply a means of separating and dividing social power. It's gotta be more than a map of form and function onto the structure of society. We have to see a constitution and a constitutional order afresh for what it really is, an evolving dynamic process of interdependence, of coordinating individual desires and actions, and of creating and expressing common values, common interests. The constitution is the foundational order of a society. It exists in a society. It constitutes the group. And in that group, people are actively and even passively conceiving of, creating, managing their basic interests, their basic values, their standards all together. That all establishes them as a political association. For me, a constitution is an association, a political association. And a constitution is the way we inform and we regulate that institution, that, that, that I'm sorry, that, that association. It's a deep structure. It speaks to our ideas of solidarity, of community, of association, and the legitimate and valid application of social power against us and our fellows and our neighbors. But these are the very issues that are challenged in a secession crisis. We are put to questioning whether that deep structure of our constitutional order should continue, collapse, or be revised. But if you're willing to accept that point, then you have accepted, in fact, secession as falling within a, con a conception of constitutional order. 
In that framework of association, we can use the principles and framework of the Constitution to manage the tensions and the political action and so on incident upon a secession crisis. And that establishes my first proposition. My second proposition, well, constitutionalizing secession is generally taken to be the recognition of a duty to negotiate in a democratic rule of law constitution. Concrete starting point for that is the 1998 decision by the Quebec secession, uh, by the, uh, sorry, by the Const Supreme Court of Canada in the Quebec secession reference, and you see the citation there. Uh, what I might do is I'll ask Mark perhaps to make available these slides to the participants, and that way you have the outline of my talk today, in addition to the link to the decision itself. Uh, and I noted as well that the Spanish Constitutional Court in its 2014 decision acknowledged and cited the Quebec secession reference, though I have my questions whether it did so correctly. However, going to the Quebec secession reference itself, in this advisory opinion, the court introduced the duty to negotiate, a novelty in constitutional law. The criteria of clarity regarding question and majority are prerequisites for this obligation to negotiate. So in a constitutional liberal democracy, under the rule of law, a clear majority voting in favor of a clearly stated option for secession ought to trigger negotiations among the relevant constitutional actors. Well, the opinion of the Supreme Court of Canada has not been read by, or has been read by many, in fact, most, not most, several, I should say. Several is a better word in English. By several commentators to constitutionalize a right to secede. The court's invocation of a duty to negotiate is interpreted as establishing a constitutional obligation to enter negotiations on the precise terms of dissolution and separation. And any refusal to negotiate, any intransigence or bad faith by the central government would undermine the legitimacy and the authority of the rump state, the central state, from both national and international perspectives, with the consequences expected to be at least a unilateral declaration of independence, as well as considerable international support and recognition for the secessionist group. And so in this way, the Quebec secession reference has become a touchstone for framing secession and independence refer referenda in constitutional terms. Well, there's a problem with this. The Quebec secession reference doesn't say that. For those of you that have read that decision, the decision does not speak of an obligation to negotiate the terms of secession. It does impose on constitutional actors an obligation to talk, to negotiate, but not specifically to negotiate the terms of secession. The predicament of the Supreme Court of Canada was to attribute some sort of constitutional significance to an independence referendum without giving it determinative effect. In other words, the voices should be heard, they should be dealt with, but those voices should not be determinative within the democracy of Canada. So its solution was to translate the expression of political will of a province into a constitutional trigger, compelling the parties to talk to one another. So this acknowledged a referendum as a constitutional channel for public political expression as part of the constitutional toolbox and thereby set the limits of its constitutional role. Now, the court explicitly rejects at paragraph 90 of its reasons, the proposition that, and I quote, that there would be a legal obligation on the other provinces and federal government to accede to the secession of a province subject only to negotiation of the logistical details of secession. And what I've put up now is a longer quote uh, in which it, uh, they justify that they could not accept that a province would invoke a right of self-determination and thereby dictate the terms of a proposed secession. I would suggest that if you take up the offer to read these slides afterwards, you can uh, read the legal English at your leisure. 
And I would invite you to remember and to hold in mind that the court reiterates at several points that even though negotiations must contemplate the possibility of secession, there would be, and I quote, no absolute entitlement to it and no assumption that an agreement, that an agreement reconciling all relevant rights and obligations would actually be reached. So it refuses to speculate on the consequences of such impasse. There is nothing in this very clear language. I'm going back to my second point now. Supporting any contention that the secession reference confers a right to secede, to effectuate or implement a separation, nor does it impose a duty to negotiate the details of secession. What it does make clear, however, is that pursuing a claim for independence within the constitutional framework necessitates characterizing it as a proposal for a particular constitutional amendment. It is a proposal by one part of the country to amend, change, revise the constitutional standing of the country, or at least that part of the country. And that proposal, and importantly, the opportunity to formulate the proposal in the first place, must be considered in earnest by the other constitutional participants. But so long as the proposal is considered, it is open to acceptance, amendment, rejection, substitution, and so on. Secession, in constitutional terms at least, becomes a defeasible proposal for constitutional change. The other parties, the other constitutional actors are not obliged to accept it, nor are they prevented from pressing an entirely different package of reforms, not including independence or autonomy, short of full independence. To contend, therefore, that a region may insist on independence as the only option open to negotiators is clearly to misunderstood the duty to negotiate. So what happens then when a regional government backs its claim to independence with a clear referendum result, with a clear question and a clear majority? Well, the federal or national government and other regional governments may not ignore or dismiss out of hand that proposal. The court says, and I quote, the constitutional order cannot remain indifferent to this clear expression of a clear majority. There is an obligation to discuss and consider the proposal, but not an obligation to accept it as inevitable and simply agree on the terms. There would have to be some change, obviously, to the constitutional structure. The status quo cannot simply continue unaffected, and the court recognizes this in its decision. And it says, other parties cannot exercise their rights in such a way as to amount to an absolute denial of Quebec's rights. And similarly, that so long as Quebec exercises its rights while respecting the rights of others, it may propose secession and seek to achieve it through negotiation. The court doesn't say achieve it, but seek to achieve it. So this gets me to my second proposition. Constitutionalizing secession is not simply another way of saying negotiations, discussions, but nor is it simply a prima facie validation of the secession proposal subject only to constitution to negotiated terms. Neither of these actually accurately capture, in my view, constitutionalism's effect on secession. To constitutionalize secession, again with the idea of the motion, not simply a reified thing, it represents a much broader understanding and manner of dealing with the political forces at work in a democracy and in a secession crisis. We integrate secession as a constitutional a possibility so that secession and secessionist forces can be controlled and managed through prescribed constitutional channels. Secession has become part of the constitutional mold of seeking cooperation and common ground amid all of the complexity that is democracy. But in so doing, in accepting it and bringing it in within the, into the constitutional mold, we have two conditions that we have to accept. And there you see the two conditions there on the screen. Constitutional implicates the entire polity, the entire demos of the state in a decision-making process. The democratic constitutional context conditions the negotiations on the deliberative engagement of all constituent parties as equal players of equal voice across the entire state. It becomes quite simply a decision for all the people as a constituent power. And no doubt many of you will want to jump up and say, yes, consider Spain and our problems in Spain. Perhaps we'll discuss that in a moment. 
constitutional under section uh, under the second part of the proposition is that it also implicates the systems for amending the constitution converting the demand for secession into a proposal a proposal to amend the constitution and i emphasize proposal because it means that proposals can be accepted rejected amended changed and so on the democratic constitutional context acquires, requires that all proposals, not imposed involuntarily, not perfunctorily rejected, seek acceptance through discussion and deliberation. Uh, the court's decision is not free from conceptual issues, fundamental issues. And the first question you might want to ask is, well, do all democratic constitutions contain this duty to negotiate? Does it apply in Spain? Does it apply in Belgium? Does it apply in the United Kingdom? The Canadian court located the duty in the unwritten constitutional principle of democracy as being inherent in that principle. The duty to negotiate, the duty to deliberate are all part and parcel of democracy. And the Canadian constitution, the court said, merely gave expression to that and did not create it. So it would follow that all democratic constitutions, or all constitutions that call themselves democratic, could very well contain such a duty as part of the continuing process of discussion in functioning healthy democracies. It would not be open to any national government claiming democratic legitimacy to distinguish away the duty as applicable only in the Canadian constitutional context. In the second place, second problem, it would be, seem that all proposals for all types of constitutional change now trigger a duty to negotiate. The Quebec secession reference, yes, concentrates upon a majority vote in favor of independence, but nowhere in the opinion does it restrict it to sovereignty referenda in its precepts on negotiating clear expressions for constitutional change by a clear majority. The duty is a general one. The court expresses it as a general duty attaching to all constitutional actors in a democracy having the right to initiate proposals for constitutional change. So whether the initiative involves secession, the conferral of powers on an international organization, changing the composition of higher courts, tax powers, other fiscal powers, doesn't matter. Each of these would trigger the duty to negotiate. And so in this sense, the constitutionalizing of secession achieves, in effect, what is a very normal and a very sound political principle. And that is, let's talk out our differences and try and seek a compromise, a workable arrangement. But what we've done now is we've engaged the entire constitutional machinery in all of that. And there's a third problem, and that's going to bring me to my third point. A central problem to the duty to negotiate is its implementation. The court has ex exercised itself at great length to weave out of constitutional threads such a duty, but it leaves the content, the substance of the duty, unspecified and undefined. The, ex ex sorry, the existence of a duty to negotiate, its trigger, and its observance through discussion are legal issues for the courts, yes, but the issues under discussion, because they are complex, and they are political, and they are social, are outside the purview of the courts. The court repeats at several, point, at several instances in its decision that it does not and cannot pronounce on the content of the duty to negotiate. So this opens the way, I think, for testing how far constitutionalizing secession is in fact practicable, let alone realistic. And here we come to my third point. Let's assume a pro-independence outcome after a referendum. Well, neither naivete nor idealism should blind us to the very real potential for the central government's hardline rejection of a referendum result for independence. A central government can always say no to regional independence. It all depends on whether the government of the day has the necessary and sufficient political capital and stamina to invest in defending the state against fragmentation. And when we phrase the question in these terms, we are looking at it in terms of a simple cost-benefit analysis of sorts. And the calculation 
will necessarily include weighing the political and economic importance of the territory as against the projected political, economic, and social costs of maintaining unity. And moreover, the investment nationally and internationally of the central government must be able to minimize instability and uncertainty and to manage any conflicts which no doubt will follow. And it is no exaggeration to say that immense pressures will be exerted on the central government from inside and from the outside as well to settle the matter quickly, easily, and once for all. And nor does this exclude the possibility of civil disobedience, violent reactions, and strife as a result of the hardline position. Blood and treasure remain the basic factors for this political calculation. So where does constitutional secession fit into all of this? Well, constitutionalizing secession represents an effort to diffuse an explosive situation, to calm inflamed passions, and to bring together the various parties, at least, at the very least, the required constitutional actors, to work out their differences in some fashion. Now, although we have spent some time concentrating on the content uh, or analyzing the duty to negotiate, I would s suggest to you that the real constitutional element to the duty to negotiate, its core ingredient, is the emphasis on deliberation and cooperation uh, which are all fundamental to any workable model of democracy. No democracy can survive without mutual and reciprocal reliance based on decisions made or endorsed by the entire community. So let's translate this into a hardline response. Yes, the people living in a region have clearly expressed their desire for change and their dissatisfaction with the current situation. Yes, to respect the outcome means that the state cannot remain deaf and intractable to this or any other expression of democratic political will. Yes, the constitution of a democratic state is not immutable and must respond to and reflect the aspirations and desires of all its people. So, this means that there will have to be discussions with the region for constitutional change, but just not to settle the terms of independence. Negotiations where independence or anything even short of full independence are concerned are not, where that, where that is the outcome, that must be the case, those are not negotiations. That's an imposition of terms. And I would suggest, in addition to that, that a hardline position doesn't constitute, in effect, a breach of the duty to negotiate. If we work even from the terms of the duty to negotiate as contemplated by the court in its Quebec secession reference, a hardline position is not a failure of the duty to undertake negotiations and pursue them according to constitutional principles. It's not unreasonable intransigence. It's not the central government saying no, 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 like a two-year-old child putting its, ear, uh, its fingers in its ears. A hardline position remains open to pursuing constitutional talks and negotiations. It's not an outright refusal. It does not disregard or dismiss out of hand the proposals adopted by a particular group seeking constitutional change. The Quebec secession reference itself does not explicitly prohibit or admonish a hardline negotiating position. And I quote, if the circumstances giving rise to the duty to negotiate were to arise, the distinction between the strong defense of legitimate interests and the taking of positions which, in fact, ignore the legitimate interests of others is one that also defies legal analysis. So if we take this comment, together with the court's express recognition that no agreement or an impasse may result, the Canadian decision offers no solid ground to impugn a hardline position as a failure to negotiate. To get any traction, we would have to drive to extremes. We would need to assume that a hardline position would presumptively doom negotiations to failure, by definition, right from the start frustrating the legitimate aims and desires of the independence group. Discussions once opened would collapse quickly because one side would refuse to consider anything other than independence and the other side anything resembling sovereignty. And no doubt many of you would think, aha, perhaps that's Spain at the moment. And the claim of, in all of this would run perhaps along the lines that an offer to negotiate by the central authority is mere puffery. It's an empty promise 
and the rump state has shown itself indifferent to the clearly expressed will of a legitimate majority in breach of its duty to negotiate. Well, let's put aside an easy objection. And that objection is we're just introducing, in other terms, a right to secede. I would suggest that there's a palpable irony here. The hardline position by an independence group hammering its claim for independence appears to exempt it appears to be exempt from the very same criticism that the central government is facing for opposing the claim to independence. In other words, an independence group can come to the table and say, independence, 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 it's our democratic right. And the central government, when it says, no, it's not your democratic right, what about the democratic rights of everyone else? The central government gets criticized. And I suggest that that's a modicum of irony. And I ask what kind of legal or political principle is it that would mandate that the central state must always concede independence and the region never concede giving it up. And at first glance, then, the hardline position, rejecting independence or substantial autonomy, appears blatantly inconsistent with concepts of constitutionalism, self-determination, and democracy. The referendum is an exercise of a primordial constitution-making power innate in a people and fundamental to democratic theory. The national constitution is not relevant, it's not binding, the national government has tolerated the referendum, the majority has made its will clear. What's more to say? It's done. Well, I think there's a problem here, and that is the unexpressed central premise of an independence referendum, namely that it's a binding ex expression of popular democracy outside the usual representative channels. And there are two elements to this. An independence referendum is assumed to be different from any other sort of referendum constitutional or otherwise. And second, a majority in one region can bind the rest of the state without its direct input. Now, the attempt to constitutionalize secession would answer this as follows. Uh, remember at the start we talked about the misnomer, the constitutional secession or constitutionalizing secession being a misnomer about the fundamental choice between orderly dissolution or violent disintegration. To constitutionalize secession means to put all the people concerned to that hard choice. If everyone is committed to democratic governance, to the rule of law, to legitimacy, and to all of that, to those very fine principles, then they must follow the constitutional path and use constitutional mechanisms to generate a statewide general acceptance of their independent project. And I pause here just to note that in Canada, that had been attempted by various Quebec premiers and Quebec ministers traveling through the country to advocate Quebec independence. In a constitutional democratic state under the rule of law, significant decisions affecting the lives of its members must be made by all and not imposed by a central authority or a regional authority without a broad base of input and support by all citizens. Yes, a referendum can indicate regional approval of a constitutional proposal. Yes, it can bind regional governments, but no, it can't force the rest of the state to accept it, it's not binding on them. Well, nonetheless, with all of this being said, many of you think that this discussion, everything that I've said today, to put it in its most polite form, is academic fluff, academic puffery, impractical, unrealistic, a waste of time, if not completely wrong-headed. This whole approach is wrong, and if it represents an accurate reading of the Quebec secession reference, then the Supreme Court of Canada is wrong too. And why? Because I seem to have missed or forgotten or ignored one simple but crucial point. How can it be that in a democratically constitutional state, how can it be for one constitutional actor in a democracy, the central government, to ignore the democratic will of a group of its citizens, whether we see that group as a constitutional actor in its own right or as voicing the desires of the citizens in a democracy. Look, if we're talking about democracy, you would say constitutionalism, the rule of law, all of these are based on the will of the people, surely. And the people, the demos of the democracy at issue here are the ones voting for or wanting to vote for independence, are they not? And frankly, if we're going to talk negotiation, in any event, we need two opposing parties. How do we get to that point? Well, yes, we don't get any help from the Quebec secession reference. The court speaks of legitimate majorities triggering the duty, but leaves unanswered what particular group constitute 
those potential majorities. It does refer to the federal government and the provincial governments, but these are the actors formally responsible in Canada for passing constitutional amendments. Nothing, however, in principle, restricts the list of potential actors to those formally recognized in provisions for constitutional amendment. There's certainly an argument to be made, and I would be willing to make it as well, that groups of citizens having differing attributes in common can form legitimate majorities to press for constitutional change. And this touches upon a theory, I think, um, uh, of one of Professor Costa's colleagues, Nico Krisch, in terms of the idea of pluralistic democracy. A democracy, a modern democracy, being a series of cross-cutting interests and multi-layering of various interest groups. These interests, these attributes can be a number of things, gender, race, religion, language, what have you. The democratic constitution stands for the benefit of its citizens who are its primary stakeholders and not for the institutions, the political parties and so on. We are talking about the pouvoir constituant in a con context of constitution making and breaking of the constituent power held by the people themselves. And any claim to take away this power from the people in this type of situation needs justification. And nor can restricting the expression of democratic will to certain specific constitutionally approved actors, such as regional entities, governments, elected representatives, this can't escape justification and explanation either. And this brings me to my fourth point foreshadowed earlier. Talking about democratic will formation in a constitutional context means speaking about the entire demos, not just one part of it. Constitutionalizing secession brings the entire population of a state into the conversation. We are not going to privilege one group over another by conferring on that group a determinative voice or veto. One of the fundamental elements of constitutionalizing secession, in my view, and the constitutionalism theory underpinning it, is that a healthy democracy is about communication, respect, and reciprocity. Members work out their problems through discussion and deliberation, rather than the forceful imposition of one viewpoint. Well, there are two ways that all of this can go horribly wrong. In the first, the central government may refuse to listen to regional concerns and not comply with its duty to negotiate. Or a region, on the other hand, may simply ignore the central government and national constitution and proceed on its own way and hold an independence referendum or insist that its voice is determinative in the matter anyway. Well, let's address the intransigent government first. I think we're there, yes. And I'm going to pass, on to these, pass over these rather quickly because I want to get to an important point that this leads up to, or that this leads to. Where a central government rejects or denies or refuses to comply with its duty to negotiate, I would simply say that this is a triumph, in a sense, of constitutional textualism and formalism. You can interpret a constitution to prohibit governments from public consultations of their constituencies, whether on a local or national level. The Belgian constitution, for instance, does that. A constitution might expressly restrict resort to referenda or simply not address referendum powers at all. Reference might be made to representative democracy, which will then be defined to exclude elements of direct democracy. Also, I could use Belgium as an, uh, an example there. Or a central government could use what powers it has under the Constitution to block a region's attempt to organize a referendum on independence or other questions. And as I said, this is a triumph of textualism and formalism. It sterilizes, in my view, the constitutional order and democracy. No realistic constitutional theory can discount or disregard the natural constant dynamism of political society or any aspect of society. Over time, a society can change how it sees itself, how it governs itself, how it does things. No constitution is eternal or immutable, even if it says so itself. Now, it doesn't mean that if you want to refashion your relationships in a democracy, you need to disintegrate the democracy or dissolve it. 
But what I am saying is that an emphasis on constitutional rigidity merely increases political pressures and the likelihood of an actual political rupture. So in other words, without interpretive and political elasticity to a constitution, a constitutional order dooms itself to civil unrest and to destruction. Well, some of you will still be unhappy because what we are, we're going to talk about next and where this leads me to next is that it doesn't accept, my theory doesn't accept the vote of a region as determinative of the independence question. It's undemocratic. A regional government will say that the constitution does not apply to its moment of democratic self-determination and self-definition as an independent polity. The constitution has no application to a referendum on independence or its subsequent demands for independence. This is outside any constitutional regulation. The constitution governs only those who would remain within its precincts. Yes, referenda on matters within the constitutional system are governed by the constitution. But a group's free, democratic vote on independence from the constitutional order is by definition outside the terms of the constitution. The question of democratic self-determination is a purely political question, not one subject to legal control, not subject to anything I've said for the past half hour. In effect, the Quebec secession reference may apply to Canada, but it certainly has no general application to all constitutions. And frankly, any constitutionalizing of secession, therefore, is impossible. Well, I don't need to remind you, I think, of the pernicious double standard at play here. A secession referendum is determinative of the question, but a referendum on any other question need not be held, respected, or addressed. As soon as a local referendum is classified as one on independence, its result is absolute, untouchable, we can't do anything about it. But if you were to hold a referendum on any other issue, no matter how important that issue might be to your daily lives, the way you vote, the taxes you pay, um, how you manage civil services, these are merely advisory, defeasible, they don't matter. What is the magic in the word independence? When in fact, there are more important things that affect your daily lives than pure independence. And in fact, you might even say that the drive to independence referenda are motivated by the fact that political will, popular political will on those more important questions has been silenced or has been ignored. So how can it be consistent, even if we're going to privilege the argument that an independence referendum should be Determinative. How can that be consistent with democracy? That one group of citizens, an overall minority, is imposing its will on the rest without allowing those others a matter, sorry, uh, a voice in the matter. A region's refusal to honor its position as part of a larger polity denies the entire demos an opportunity to reconsider the terms of their association and common commitments. It denies them, those, all those other people, a fundamental democratic right of self-determination in their own respect. And my contention here is that only a constitutionalized secession with the conditions of defeasibility proposals and after a full and fair deliberation and the need to have the input of all citizens on the proposal meets the conditions of an orderly, democratically legitimate dissolution of a state. Now, no doubt many of you, ladies and gentlemen, are not satisfied with the position I have taken here today. And in a sense, I agree with you. And I'm willing to join with you, questioning what I've said. Because I have to admit to a long-standing problem with this approach, this way of thinking about constitutional democracies, constitutionalism, and so on. In fact, it's something that troubled me when I first began to assemble the pieces of this theory and this model and then put it into a book form. And in fact, it's the very issue that engages me now, today, keeps me awake. Let, let's get at it this way. What if a region sought constitutional change, call it secession, call it tax reform, whatever, repeatedly, but it was rejected repeatedly, rebuffed by the central government and by other regions? Didn't even get to the discussion stage because of political machinations, what have you, rather than reasoned dismissal. Well. My remedial right theory would have to say, well, that's a failure to accord sincere recognition. 
democracy and democratic constitutionalism has broken down. So we're not really dealing with a healthy democracy, are we? I'm not saying it's a breach of the duty to negotiate, but because that would be too formalistic, that would be a fault. It's a breach, it's not a breach of something formalistic, it is an undermining of the very nature of democratic engagement. The second way of looking at it, what if the central government or organs of national governance denied a region the opportunity to formulate proposals for significant constitutional change? Proposals that would be drawn from or supported by popular endorsement. Well, and the central government could point to explicit constitutional provisions, for example, that emphasize national unity and national, a national process for constitutional change. And there's no need to assume bad faith, insincerity on part of the central authority. Here I would have to say that the emphasis on text and form has come at a serious cost to the performative idea of constitutions as democratic. An institutional focus has overpowered what would otherwise be a healthy democracy. Let me make this point, my troubling point, even clearer. Why do we even need to consider a constitutional democratic way to secede? See, in all of this, when we talk about constitutionalizing secession and so on, we are focusing on the breakdown of a constitutional democratic association, of a democracy. And our focus is on an unhealthy democracy. And focusing on secession and how we're supposed to do it blinds us, or perhaps a better way of saying it is that it redirects our attention away from the real question, and that is, what is a healthy democracy? And that's what is occupying me now. In fact, well, put it this way, shouldn't we know what parts are healthy? They may be ugly, they may be misshapen, but they're still healthy. And which parts are diseased? before we start planning our amputation. For example, is a democracy a pluralistic federation? Sort of layering of groups, cooperating in certain matters, not cooperating on others, having exclusive, shared, concurrent powers? Is a democracy always getting what you want? What is the limit of compromise? What is it that actually binds us together as a political association? In this sense, Look at the problems of populism that are now rampant in other countries of the world. Imagine that a section of the population wants horrible, wicked things. You might say, ah, thank goodness for majoritarianism. The majority will iron out all of that nastiness. But what happens if a majority of the country wants horrible, wicked things? What do we do about that? So let me sketch out some of my thinking as a way of concluding this talk on these this central critical matter. I have emphasized an engagement of citizens with one another, an engagement of citizens, with citizens, and with their institutions. And by institutions, I don't simply mean regions, governments, and so on. I also mean political parties. And in a sense, this might be seen as a cheat because I haven't yet given you the details or the concrete aspects of that engagement. And I admit that just talking or informal mechanisms don't generally lead to concrete policy and action unless they're backed by some sort of sanction or a downside risk. But let me say that this doesn't force me to say that a healthy democracy is always some form of institutionalized populism, direct democracy. Yes, the people have to be connected more closely to their institutions. It's a fundamental principle of democracy that those who are making the laws those who are determining the content and the implementation of those laws are the ones who are going to be subject to them. So that means that citizens have to take up actively the responsibility of governance and not simply leave it to a political class or administrators or some others with hopes that all will be okay. Democracy needs institutions to shape and give form and manage or direct popular will, but institutions should not replace or overshadow citizen input. Of course, I haven't yet got to an answer of what does this mean by way of political connection? What is it that makes us all a political association? Sitting here today, we are an association. There are certain rules, and I'm going to be told to be quiet shortly, uh, otherwise I'll be in breach of a rule. We've all come together as an association, 
And I don't see much difference in terms of this association with civic groups, government groups, and so on. There may be a level of formality in that, but I think that philosophically, constitutionally, there is a core that connects them all. And unfortunately, or perhaps fortunately, I've not yet determined what that is. So I'm afraid that I'm going to have to leave you with more questions than answers. Or at least, let me put it this way, I invite you all to think about what a democracy should be, what it is in practice, what is a healthy democracy. And it's only by understanding what a healthy democracy is that we can begin to treat or cure what ails it. And so that ends my prepared talk. And I would welcome any questions or comments after Professor Costa has demonstrated where I've made critical errors in thinking. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor, for your very interesting and debatable, of course, presentation. Uh,